Welcome, everyone. I see the number of attendees going up. Where is this going to end? <laughs> Place your bets. Welcome everyone. We'll uh, we'll give participants a few more minutes so that we know everyone is is on the is on the line before we start. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to the new uh, joiners. We'll, we'll, we'll wait one more minute before we start so that we because we're still seeing the number of participants increase. Thanks for your patience. Just bear with us a few more minutes. Thanks. Before we start, I may do a quick comment. Um, you will see on the Zoom platform, there is a chat and a Q&A feature. If you have questions for the team here, just use the Q&A feature um, as we can't really track uh, effectively all the questions that come in through the chat feature. So do not use the chat feature for questions. Please use the Q&A function. Thank you very much. We'll uh, get going in, in one minute. Great, let's start then. Welcome everyone. So good morning or afternoon to everybody on the line and welcome to this GRES webinar about embodied carbon in the real estate sector. Uh, my name is Charles Van Thiel and I'm real estate director at GRES. And for the ones who do not know GRES, uh, GRES is the global ESG benchmark for real assets and our benchmarking tool covers both real estate and infrastructure. Although today we'll be, we'll be, we're going to be focusing on the real estate uh, sector. It is very important to know that although this webinar is organized by, is organized by GRES, its main purpose is, is not to share with you details on what you can expect going forward in terms of assessment development. The purpose of this webinar is purely educational and explores multiple frameworks that may or may not be reflecting the GRES standards of the future. So we're only here today to raise awareness and spread knowledge with you to the industry on a topic deemed very relevant, being embodied carbon. Um, next slide, please. Great. No, please go back to the agenda. So here in an overview of what we'll be covering together today, um, I will start with a high level reminder of what, of what the GRES five-year assessment roadmap process looks like, which will also explain to you a little bit more why we're talking about embodied carbon today. Um, my colleague, who I'll introduce in a minute, will cover the topic of embodied carbon at a high level, as, uh, as well as provide you with some insight that comes straight from the 2021 GRES real estate assessment. After that, we'll be joined by Ito, one of the global leaders in life cycle assessment for the built environment, who will do a deep dive into some of the more common accounting and benchmarking aspects of embodied carbon. And finally, we'll use the end of the session to address questions. We'll, we'll try to we'll do our best to answer as many questions as, as we can. Uh, but I please keep in mind that I already do see a few hundred people on the line with us. So if we don't manage to go through all of the questions, we'll do our very best to follow up with you offline. On that note, as I mentioned already earlier, if you do have questions or comments, please use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat feature. 
the, the, the CUNY function allows us to track us more effectively and get rid of the, uh, the, the questions that have already been addressed. So do not, we will not address the questions that have been raised in the chat feature. So yeah, thanks for your understanding. Next slide, please. So I'm obviously not alone today. Uh, I have the chance to be joined by three very bright minds. Uh, Victor Fonseca is a real estate analyst at GRESP. He's been with the organization for more than two years now and has been, among a lot of other things, leading our efforts on the embodied carbon front. Enrique Mendonca, the co-CEO at E2, has over 10 years of experience uh, in the field. And Enrique has, uh, under his belt, a lot of uh, major contribution aiming to decarbonize the construction industry. So it's a real honor for Gress to have him as a guest speaker today. And we, finally, we have Adrian Giles, Business Development Manager at E2. Adrian has, has more than 12 years experience uh, in the, working in the construction industry and has worked with various types of organization in that sector. So. Uh, thank you in advance to all three speakers for your contribution. I'm uh, personally very much looking forward to listening to your presentation. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Before I hand over to my colleagues, let me briefly provide you with a short overview of the GRES assessment roadmap process. We'll, uh, as I said earlier, we'll explain to you a little bit more why we're talking about this, this topic today. Next slide, please. In a nutshell, the GRES assessment roadmap process is an 18 months process, which started back uh, in September last year, which has as a main purpose to redevelop the GRES standards for both real estate and infrastructure for the years to come. The process is divided into three phases, um, where the key objective of phase one was to define in collaboration with the industry, uh, so a lot of you on the call, uh, the vision for the GRES standards for the future. If you, go, if you go to the next slide. Earlier um, in January this year, we published a vision of the GRES standard, which was the, the main deliverable of the phase one, uh, for which we also provide a link at the bottom um, of this slide. And this vision is supported by eight, is supported by may, eight main principles, along with some more details about what each principle means exactly. And one of those principles is that the GRES standards should assess ESG through the whole life cycle which uh, without going into the details already gives you an indication of what you can expect from the GRES standards in the future, but only in terms of co topic covered rather than way to address this topic. Thank you. Thank you for the slide. Another key input from that first phase uh, of our assessment roadmap process was to identify key ESG issues requiring further development in GRES standards. So as shown in this slide, embodied carbon was one of the top uh, eight issues identified, supporting even more the reason uh, of discussing this topic today with you. So I would like to reiterate once more that the purpose of this webinar is purely educational, meaning that you know, if a particular framework is covered during this session, it does not mean that it will necessarily be adopted in, in the same way as in the GRES standard in the future. It is really to spread uh, knowledge here. Hope everything is clear uh, so far. Uh, I will now hand over to my colleague, Victor, for, um, as I said earlier, a high level introduction to the topic of embodied carbon. Victor, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Charles. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Victor, and I'm here today to talk a little bit more about uh, embodied carbon and tell you about what it is and why it matters. Uh, I will address it at a high level. It too will go a little bit deeper when it comes to information. But as Charles mentioned, this was one of the ESG issues that were raised uh, by us, uh, by our stakeholders to us. And now GRASP is creating the strategy to incorporate uh, this into our GRASP standards of the future. But uh, maybe let's take a step back and ask ourselves what embodied carbon is. So embodied carbon is the carbon emissions associated with materials and construction processes throughout the whole life cycle of a building. This not only means the upstream emissions, meaning the value chain emissions all the way from the extraction of raw materials until actually constructing the building, but also downstream emissions. So emissions associated with maintaining the building, repairing, refurbishing, and also end of life treatment of these materials. So why it matters? So now 11% uh, of the total annual GHG emissions come from materials and construction. This is embodied carbon. And if we put that in the real estate perspective, 28% uh, of the total emissions coming from the building sector represents embodied carbon. 
And this portion actually tends to increase in light of operational energy efficiency programs, grid decarbonization, the portion represented by embodied carbon and the overall carbon footprint of your building will be more significant. Uh, and this uh, organization called uh, Architecture 2030 actually puts into perspective embodied carbon with some nice uh, stats that I would like to share with you. So it is expected that in 2060, the building stock will double compared to what we have today. This means 230 billion of new floor area added to the uh, existing building stock. To put into perspective, this is equivalent of adding an entire New York City every month for the next 28 years. So this gives you the order of magnitude of what we're talking about here today. On the, on the graph on the right, it also illustrates these figures. So this graph actually talks about the total carbon emissions of global new construction from 2020 to 2050, considering a scenario of business as usual. So if you have a, a look by 2030, this new construction, all the energy, all the, embodied, the, all the carbon emitted through it, 74% of this come from embodied carbon. If we project even longer 2050, this roughly represents 50%. So these are a few points to put into perspective why it matters and why we should raise awareness on the topic. But when talking about embodied carbon, it's also important to bring these two EN standards because they also address embodied carbon. Uh, the first one is the EN 15978, uh, which defines the life cycle stages of a building, but also modules within these life cycle stages so you can pinpoint carbon emissions, for example. This standard uh, specifies the calculation method, which is through a life cycle assessment approach to assess your environmental footprint of your building. This is not only applicable for new developments, but also for existing buildings. You can also see this bar uh, colored by green and, and orange. This was extracted by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development paper, uh, the Building System Carbon Framework, which better illustrates where those emissions actually happen. So everything you see in green actually is embodied carbon for the life cycle of the building. And operational carbon only represents the B6 and B7 module as you can see in the picture. Another standard is the EN 15A04, which talks about environmental product declarations. It comes and harmonizes a, a structure for creating those declarations. So ensuring uh, transparency and comparable data for the construction sector. There are three types of, uh, of uh, EPDs. First one being cradle to gate, meaning the carbon footprint to so the environmental footprint or your, of your product from extraction of raw materials until the manufacturing of the product itself. We also have cradle to gate with options, which is uh, including the product stage, but also any other life cycle stage that you desire to assess for the carbon footprint of your product. But also we have the cradle to grave, which is a complete assessment of the environmental footprint of your product, considering all life cycle stages of your product. But we also have other frameworks in the industry that addresses embodied carbon. And I've uh, picked four relevant references that I would like to talk to you today. But the first one, as I've shown the last slide, is the one from World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Building System Carbon Framework. There is the RICS, which is the whole life carbon assessments for the building environments. There is the Better Building Partnership one, which is the Net Zero Carbon Pathway Framework and also the world GBC uh, bringing embodied carbon up front. What is interesting to note is that all these four uh, frameworks have a common ground between them, uh, which are defining the reporting boundaries based on the uh, life cycle stages of a building, but also defining the reporting requirements. So what should be included in your life cycle analysis? For example, if you take the RICS, uh, it provides guidance not only how to assess your carbon footprint throughout the life cycle stages, but also throughout the building layers. So foundation, structure, furniture, et cetera. But uh, one interesting takeaway that, uh, that I would like to present from one of these frameworks uh, is the one from the, from the building system carbon framework that uh, specifies two different flows of value chain. The first one uh, is the building value chain, as you can see in blue. 
uh, the building value chains composed by sectors that physically construct and operate those buildings throughout the life cycle. So these value chains is actually responsible directly for their emissions. On the other hand, we also have the influencer value chain, uh, which are players that have key role in very early stages of, of the building. So design uh, stage, planning stage, and that decision will actually impact the future emissions of this building. So directly, they don't have that much impact with emissions, but indirectly, they influence the whole value chain behind. And this is where GRASP is uh, in an influencer uh, uh, value chain, trying to trigger a change from top down. And this is another reason why we are here uh, with an educational purposes and raising awareness on embodied carbon. But Charles already mentioned that uh, we are considering including embodied carbon in the GRASP standard in the future, but we do have some uh, analytics, some insights that we can present to you now uh, based on the, on the GRASP assessment of today. So based on the 2021 responses for our assessment, uh, this only considering the developer benchmark, just to put into perspective, we're talking about 516 participants. We ask a few questions about embodied carbon. The first one is DMA1, so material selections and requirements. 52% of these participants have a policy requiring embodied, low embodied carbon materials for the development projects. We go one step further, we ask, uh, is your entity assessing the life cycle emissions of these development projects? Only 36% of those could answer yes. And then we could also draw some analytics, what standards are they looking at? Or what, what, what is the baseline for that? 35 of those uh, use the EN15978, the one that I just presented to you. 29 of those follow the principles of the standard of ISO 14040 that I haven't addressed, but this will be addressed further on with, uh, with it too. Uh, and also it's important to say that they are not mutually exclusive. These overlap, they, they they act together. And more importantly, and one of the most interesting insights that I've drawn from these analytics is the DMA 2.2, where we ask uh, if your entity have disclosed the embodied carbon emissions of their development projects in the last three years. Only 17% of these participants, we are talking about roughly of 80 participants, developers, real estate funds, have disclosed the embodied carbon emissions of their development projects in the last three years. We go a little bit further with this indicator and we ask if these disclosures are publicly available. And this drops a little bit more. So 45% of these participants have disclosed it publicly. So we're talking about 40 participants now. And GRASP went uh, through a qualitative exercise. So we went through the disclosures, we mapped some data points to draw some analytics. And the first one was actually checking if this disclosure are mentioning embodied carbon at all. And uh, only 82.5% of those mentioned embodied carbon. The 17.5 uh, remaining, either the links were broken, we were not able to assess it, or they didn't mention embodied carbon at all. So it also flags to us there are some misconception uh, of what embodied carbon is uh, in the industry. And again, another point why we are doing this webinar today. Going further, 48.7% have any embodied carbon targets. This, uh, this means like reduction target for five years, 10 years, a net zero target, et cetera. But the most interesting one for me is the last one. Only 17.5%, this means eight participants out of 516 have a whole life carbon roadmap to net zero. And I think this is interesting because this puts into perspective what we, what uh, the industry, where the industry has to be, where our stakeholders flag to us that we have to consider in our grasp assessment and body carbon is a material issue. And, where, and also where the industry is now, when we have only eight participants out of 516 answering or responding uh, when it, uh, to whole life carbon roadmap to net zero. So with this, I'll, finalize my, my presentation. Uh, we will have some space for questions uh, by the end of it, but now I would like to hand over to, to it too. Uh, so Adrian, uh, the floor is yours. Fantastic, thanks very much, Victor. Um, 
great to see obviously the work that Chris have done there. It's really insightful. So as I mentioned, my name is Adrian Giles. I'm the Business Development Manager for eTool. Um, for those of you who don't know who eTool are, I'm just going to go through um, a few of the slides. Um, so, so eTool, we are uh, an Australian-based company. Uh, we have the head offices in Perth in Australia. But we have offices in London and Brazil as well. And we've been established for around about 12 years now. Um, we produce eTool LCD um, software to measure the embodied and operational carbon impacts um, across your projects. And we also have a consultancy arm to the business as well, which perform um, LCA studies on behalf of obviously the, the customer. Um, next slide. So a few key points of difference for eTool. So we've conducted well over 450 um, different projects at the moment. Sorry, 450 different projects. Um, across obviously for LCA, um, of which 100 plus being BRIAM lead projects, uh, Green Star Living Building Challenge, um, and we've conducted peer reviews for different typologies, whether that's um, retail, residential, office, warehouse, um, and, and, and the list goes on. Um, the actual eTool LCD software is around about 4,000 um, software subscribers use software at the moment. We've around about 5,000 projects in flight currently at the moment. Um, next slide. So the international rating schemes, eTool LCD so as a software, um, follows all the international rating schemes such as BRIAM, LEED, ISCA, Green Star, um, DGMB. Um, in Australia, obviously, Neighbours, and in the UK, we've got the Neighbours, obviously, as well, um, which can be obviously, can, we can follow that in eTool LCD as well. And for more infrastructure based projects, obviously, you've got a C4. So, Victor touched on it earlier on, but eTool LCD um, we supports all regulatory requirements and frameworks. Um, the London plan, which came out last year, eTool has been approved as one of the official um, tools to be used on London plan. Um, and the software follows the RICS whole life carbon assessment for the built environment, along with things like advancing net zero. And obviously you have the obviously GRESP obviously um, as well, which obviously we can follow GRESP requirements. So to give you an idea of who we work with, so the likes of JLL um, as well, WSP, Jacobs, Mace, main contractors, architects such as Foster and Partners, HTA, um, and Fraser's obviously property as well in Australia and globally. So carbon accounting and, and scope three. I'm gonna be discussing this today and obviously and versus carbon accounting and embodied carbon. So the GHG protocol set out 15 reporting categories for scope three emissions that are categorized into upstream and downstream emissions. So you can see on the right hand side there in the, in the, the uh, image, um, you have the upstream, upstream activities, which are your scope threes, and obviously then your downstream, which is upstream uh, with scope threes as well. And you have the scope one direct emissions and scope two indirect emissions. So all greenhouse gas emissions, which a reporting company has no direct ownership of, or control over as known as the scope three emissions. Um, upstream emissions refer to those related to purchased or acquired goods or services. So for instance, emissions from logistics for logistics for developments, waste for operation and developments, and emissions from office space leased from other companies. And your downstream emissions refer to those related to sold goods and services. So that could be anything from assets leased to organizations or waste disposal and treatment for products sold by the company. However, it's extremely important to distinguish between embodied carbon and what is classified as scope three. So for example, tenant energy use is reported as scope three. However, it's actually not embodied carbon. It's actually indirect emissions not controlled by the owner. Or another example being equipment use. So that depends whether or not it's indirect, is directly controlled by the organization. Therefore, it's going to be scope three or subcontracted. Obviously, so scope one, sorry. And or if it's subcontracted, it will then become scope three. So there's quite a bit of ambiguity there. And since scope three emissions are not directly under a company's control, it's quite difficult to assess. 
but we can't afford to ignore that and obviously bypass it anymore. And it's here where we can highlight the difference between just carbon accounting in scope three versus carbon accounting and embodied carbon. So a key aspect is to understand and, and the embodied carbon in a project across its whole life cycle, rather than just obviously the scope three. And to adopt, to, to follow that is to adopt uh, a recognised and standardised methodology. And Victor mentioned, touched on it earlier on. Um, and there's a few different methodologies out there at the moment uh, that allow you to set benchmarks and, tar and targets, which can be established in a consistent way. So EN 15978 is the assessment um, used for life cycle assessment and it's assessment of environmental performance of buildings. You also have EN 15804, which is obviously, as Victor mentioned, is for EPDs. Now there's a new one coming out in July this year called EN 15804 plus A2, and that's becoming mandatory. And is based on the European Commission's Product Environmental Footprint, or PEF, as it's, it's abbreviated to. Now that's going to bring in some extra additional reporting for EPDs from a, from a life cycle point of view. Um, and it's also going to bring along consistency between EPDs. There's a lot of EPDs out there at the moment that can be reporting on certain aspects, and then a, a, a comparative EPD maybe not reporting on so much. By following this PEF framework, it's going to bring alignment so you can really assess each EPD fairly. Um, you also have the 14044 ISO standard for environmental management by cycle assessment. And that covers things like goals and scope of the LCA, the life cycle inventory analysis, the life cycle impact assessment as well. Uh, and life cycle interpretation, but also touches on reporting of the critical review of the LCA. The ISO 14044 standard effectively um, describes the requirements and guidelines for 14040. So Victor brought this slide up earlier on, um, a, a version of this slide in regards to um, the timeline, the whole life cycle carbon. So any assets or products that have environmental impacts throughout the whole life um, have, have, have anybody over, have a, a carbon impact. Um, the methodologies mentioned previously in the previous slide use life cycle assessment as the main approach, as opposed to just embodied, embodied carbon accounting, and provides an approach to understand the measures and impacts at each life cycle stage. So all the LCAs require boundaries, which are classed as system boundaries, and reflect the life cycle stages across the process. So Victor has mentioned earlier on about the cradle to gate, cradle to grave, and there's also cradle to cradle when you look at the, um, the impacts from uh, manufacturing the product all the way through to section D, which is um, reuse effectively. Um, carbon is going to be obviously associated across A, the A's, B's and C's uh, with operational, obviously in the more the reuse uh, uh, sort of stages and operational energy use and operational water use as well. So the EM15978 calculation method is pretty much for norm when it comes to LCA assessments and is a real strong reliance on the ISO 14040 and 14044 standards. So as a science-based methodology for quantifying the impacts across the whole life cycle of a project, this is the most efficient way of doing things. And that can be associated to whether or not that's a new build or an existing product or project as well. So to put that into some context, so over the past decade, um, the focus has been around reducing the operational carbon of, of a building. So as a result of that, the embodied carbon as now represents quite a significant contributor to total emissions. So to show this in practice, in this graph here, we take the assumption that the steady rate of growth in new construction between 2020 and 2070, and based on the embodied carbon accounted for around about one fifth of the building life cycle emissions. So with these assumptions in mind, if it's predicted that both the embodied and operational carbon um, will have the same impact up until around about 2050, and after that, the operational carbon becomes more prevalent. However, if you actually factor in decarbonisation for operational energy, it's actually the embodied carbon will dominate life cycle impacts across the course of the, the time frame. So as you can see by this blue line here. So 
carbon relief, uh, emissions released before the building begins to be used, so the upfront carbon, um, will be responsible for half of the entire carbon footprint of new construction between now and 2050. So as you can see by this graph, the, green, the upfront carbon, so the green bar, is the dominant factor. And as the opera opera operational carbon reduces, so the gray obviously bar down the bottom, is the embodied carbon will continue to grow. So the blue, tar, blue bars here are looking at the replacement and refurbishment cycles, but also as well, the demolition and disposal as well. So while we must continue to focus on addressing the operational carbon, we must now actually increase the efforts to tackle the embodied carbon and emissions too. So if you look at utilizing LCA across the value chain, when we look at the embodied carbon of buildings, it's also important to consider not only the construction phase, so the A1s to A5s, but also as well the maintenance and refurbishment across the life cycle of the building, so the Bs and Cs. So depending on the replacement rate and building of the building components, it actually can be really considerable and comparative to the actual construction impacts. So you can see here on the, on the uh, pie chart, um, around about probably 60 percent there of obviously embodied obviously component, and but the embodied B2Cs is not far behind at all. So by utilizing the LCA methodology, investors can quantify the environmental impacts of their existing portfolio by following um, LCA methodology to look at maybe modeling existing buildings for adaptive reuse, the footprinting or as built of existing buildings, um, retrofits and refurbishment of existing, existing buildings, new buildings that remain parts of the existing buildings and recording in use emissions to understand the carbon impacts of maintenance, repair and replacement. So, as the client's knowledge of embodied carbon increases, um, assessments utilising the LCA methodology and undertaken an early in the design phase can become easier to use for decision making. So this in turn is going to lead to increased opportunities to take action and to reduce the embodied carbon impact of products and activities as well. So in this graph, we highlight how an investor or a developer can reduce the embodied carbon based on decisions deriving from the LCA results and using examples, strategies such as building nothing or you can explore different alternatives. Um, designing more efficient buildings, so reducing the materials and energy demand, prioritizing circular design, which is a massive one, um, less new buildings and more reuse and refurbishment. I know in the London plan, there is a massive emphasis on reuse rather than building new. Um, requiring design optimization for use, for use, less material and use lower carbon materials, and also as well, build efficiently. So low carbon procurement to ensure that materials are used and lower impact than average. So to summarize the benefits of using LCA to calculate embodied carbon, um, you're basically obviously run on reliable industry-based data. You have the EPDs, which obviously the new um, EPD, obviously EM15804 um, methodology coming out in July this year, that's gonna increase that even further. You also have the LCA process-based inventory. Um, it's sound, it follows obviously a whole process. The data quality requirements, ISO standards, EN standards, obviously all following the whole life carbon and environmental impacts, obviously, especially embodied. Um, there's many tools out there as well. E-Tool LCD, obviously our tool, we, uh, is used to obviously measure the environmental impacts of, of a project, but there's many tools out there on the market as well to help you do that. Um, with the emergency BIM, larger scale projects, you're going to have a BIM model. Um, there's many softwares, including our own, that now have integration with something like Revit, for argument's sake. Um, with the Revit integration, as you look at strategies and reduced embodied carbon, obviously in your building via the Revit model, then it will feed into the LCA model within the LCA tool, and obviously then make those, those changes as well. Um, also as well, from a tool perspective, you're looking at collaboration. It's vitally important everyone's looking at it from the same perspective and obviously can offer their, obviously, um, their views and, and obviously to, to have a, a to, to really influence the design. Um, 
I know with eTool LCD, we can allow people to use the software for read-only. So you can share that model with your clients. You can share it with your design team. You can share it with your contractors. They each have an input on the, the design as well. So really collaboration is key. Uh, consistency as well, common metrics, standard compliant results. Um, you're following the standards. You're getting obviously the reports that are all standard compliant. I think more importantly as well is the independent review. So. ISO 14040 and ISO 14044, they call for all LCA studies to be verified. So this ensures that you've got a consistent and high quality LCA study. Uh, we, as, a, as an organization at ETOOL, we, for any consultancy uh, LCA that we conduct, we conduct that study on behalf of the client and obviously you can review that as well. But also from a software point of view, if you're conducting an LCA study, um, we offer that as a free of charge service as well. So you've got peace of mind that one, that your knowledge obviously of the software and obviously in conducting the LCAs is sound, but also as well knowledge that that's going to be a robust LCA study that you've created as well to measure the environmental impact. Uh, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Henrique now, um, who will discuss the benchmarking further. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks also, Charles, Peter, and the whole whole GRASP team who put this event together and thanks to all the participants. This is really exciting to have that many uh, people engaged and wanting to um, get up to date and take action. So it's, it's yeah, really glad we organized this event. It puts a lot of pressure on me now having um, a good quality presenters, but oh, we, we also thinking, you know, how can we address um, this content to a, such a diverse audience, right? Because we have different motivation for attending this event. There's more the technical consultants that wanted to actually do the calculations, there's the investors, the asset managers. So as Charles mentioned at the beginning, we kept this very um, generic, more overview of, benchmark, of benchmarking body carbon but I'll bring up some technical aspects as well so we can start getting more used to the numbers, get more used to the more in-depth discussion in, in preparation for what's coming. And one important aspect is when you look at embodied carbon, you, you have to prevent looking at one specific area of your project. You need to do your whole life carbon assessment and the embodied carbon is part of that assessment. You need to understand how everything interacts. Right. So we have, as Adrian and Victor mentioned, we have um, been uh, increasing the consistency, which is really important for credibility, for legislation. So you need to do it in a transparent way and um, following the standard. So that's really important as well. And what we found with, with benchmarking at early stage is you, you, you identify hotspots, you identify opportunities that you would no, you would not have seen before if you're just doing your business as usual, business as usual practice. So you future proof, future proofing your asset, designing for for deconstruction or decommissioning, depending on the the, the application of your your asset. You're identifying how you can implement circularity principles, reducing that upfront emissions, designing for durability as well, and most important most importantly for functionality. So that's one key aspect of reducing embodied um, carbon is improving the, the primary function of your asset. So we'll go through that in more detail, but I'll bring in the next slides um, uh, some numbers, right? I think we're all used to talking about kilowatt hours per meter square energy consumption, how to reduce um, heating loads and all of that, but carbon is is a little bit more subjective. So we, it's important. The reason why I bring in these numbers here is important for us to start getting used to these figures, getting used to the measurement units and and how it's calculated in preparation for the uh, you know what's coming up with legislation, for example. It's which is already implemented in 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 many countries, but I think that's a global trend in. In, in standardizing the way we measure this and how we report this and how we can regulate this. So the indicator is global warming potential. So the potential for the building to hit the planet, right? Using a commercial office here as an example, it's measured in, in kilograms of CO2 equivalent. 
So we have all the different greenhouse gases, but they are all weighted and in, in normalized into one common metric, which is the equivalent in CO2. And it's also considering a lifespan of 60 years. So you can account for the lifespan of the building, including the operational, the maintenance, and all that, and also the assumption for the end of life, the demolition impact, and so on. So uh, 1,300 kilograms, 1.3 tons. This is a, a average benchmark figure, considering both the upfront carbon, which dominates the, the emissions, as we've seen from previous slides, but also highlighting the importance of the ongoing emissions from uh, the use stage and end of life. This figure uh, comes from different studies. Obviously, at E2, we have done a lot of these, and they are um, correlate. They, they correlate with the results we get out of our, our tool, but there's other studies from um, the Carbon Leadership Forum, the, from the University of Washington in the US, studies, benchmark studies from uh, Letty, the London Energy Transformation Initiative in the UK, the RIBA, the climate, the challenge, the proposing so we can reduce carbon. They're all coming up with the, the, the figures that are within the same range. And it's very difficult because it's a complex methodology and you have to have consistency. So it's, it's interesting that the industry is coming together to, to standardize these figures so we can move on to, to actually regulating this. Next one, please, Victor. So how to achieve that consistency is really important. Um, Adrian and Victor both mentioned before the standards and guidance, even um, yeah, the, the EN standards and the RICS, which is, is been heavily used to support legislation. It's really important we identify the, the life cycle stages. So what are you actually capturing in your, in your model? and also the scope. So we've seen differences in the results when um, you're not accounting for foundations, for example, you only account for the structural elements from the superstructure, or you're not including services, which is, has also a significant contribution to the overall impact. So not only the life cycle stages, but also the construction scope. What are you actually including in your analysis? Um, then uh, integrating that with product data. So there's a lot more EPDs being produced now. Uh, I think it's going to be um, a must have thing for every supplier to be transparent about the performance. And it's, it, it, and it's important to not, not because you have an EPD, because you have a, a, a good performance. It's, it's, it's more about that transparency. So you can improve your um, your performance once once you have quantified the impact um, and independent review. So you've been uh, verified, uh, it's transparent, your assumptions are clear for whoever's interpreting the results. So it's really important we have that uh, independent peer review as well. Next one, Peter, please. Okay, so what, what we've seen, I think as a next, stage to this, you know, we're talking about benchmarking, understanding how it works and getting the industry together to build that consistency. I think the next stage that we're seeing is regulation. We don't have a lot of time to act on this. It's very urgent. The climate crisis is demanding immediate action and legislation will speed things up significantly. So we've seen, for example, the London plan policy setting out requirements to, to calculate and also reduce whole life carbon emissions. The reduction targets are not very strict yet, but I think we are in the process of collecting data, coming together as, um, as an industry on, on, on our starting point. And then from then onwards, we will start bringing the, the reduction targets with a bit, bit more effort. Um, one other example is the amendment to the UK building regulations to introduce uh, legislation towards um, carbon reduction and aligning the, and, and actually putting a limit, so we're putting a cap into how much 
pollution and how much emissions you can uh, be responsible for with your assets. In general, regulations will help create free to use products and, and building database to reduce complexity. So because we're getting more and more people using lifecycle assessment tools, developing database, it's going to become easier and cheaper for everyone to have access to. So there's no excuses, no um, barriers for designers, architects, engineers, asset owners to actually make this part of your core um, design and, and operation practice. One um, important action I think we can all take from completed projects is conducting an as built calculation. The reason why I think that's important is because you have real data. So a lot of the uncertainty with imported carbon calculations is the quality of the data, the input data. And with as built calculation, you have accurate measurement of the, 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 the completed project. You can get specific, detailed specification and transportation impact for materials. Um, you can also track the construction impacts. So the, the wastage and the, the machinery use. So having that data, it's, it's, it's going to bring value to, the, to, the, to this exercise because it's representing the actual status at your company. So I think this is really important to use as good calculation to as part of this benchmarking exercise. Next one. Um, this is more of a, well, this is actually really, really important, but it's also very philosophical because um, how do we know, how do we act on a problem that it's, it's very subjective, right? And I think COVID and the whole pandemic um, is a good example of how we can come together and make change. Um, with, with COVID, we, we adapted, we changed, we implemented because the, the, the issue, the problem came to everyone very close, very near every one of us. So it was very easy for us to take action. But with uh, the climate crisis, you know, we're seeing more extreme weather. We're seeing more uh, changes in, 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 in rainfall patterns and, and extreme uh, hot climates. We've seen that occasionally, but it's not on our day-to-day -day, um, lives. So the, how much carbon we actually have to reduce, it's... it's I think it's really important to bring. It's, 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 a, it's a bit of a shock, really, to think about it this way, but I think it's important. So the, the, the recent IPCC report has defined a carbon budget. So how much carbon emissions we have left to emit to the atmosphere in order to keep the planet at 1.5 degree in temperature increase. And that's uh, 400 billion tons it sounds like a lot, but it's not that much because we are at the moment at a run rate globally between 36 and 40 uh, billion tons, which gives us 10, 11 years left if we continue at this rate. So what we're talking about here is the urgency. And that's why the embodied carbon is so important because we lock in that emissions up front. Once that is locked in, the buildings are completed. There's no way out of it. So it brings that urgency on, on, on the upfront emission reduction and it, it needs to be done urgently. So that's, that's the reason why I brought this, this to, to understand that urgency. Next, uh, and we've also seen a lot of cool things happening from realizing this urgency, right? We're seeing a lot of the, the, the designers, because this is a performance-based target, right? Once you say, for example, you need to reduce your project impact, uh, upfront impact or embodied impact by 40%, you give the flexibility to the design team, to your project team to come up with the best strategies. You're not telling them specific prescriptive Measure, measurements to reduce impact. You're letting 
smart people come up with the best solutions that make sense for their business practice, right? So the, the more, as Adrian and Victor mentioned before, the more we increase operational efficiency, the more we decarbonize the grid, we highlight the importance of the embodied carbon reduction. So we've seen a lot of the, the guidance and the, the benchmarking exercise proposing a 40% reduction target you know, by 2030. I personally think that's, that's too long because we've seen the urgency. You know, we've already seen a lot of projects coming up with, with some clever design, so reducing, um, reducing impact upfront. So I think it's, it's important we increase that target, you know, as more we can to, to, yeah, to just have a viable, uh, a viable, a viable future in, in balance with the planet. So this is, I think, one starting point, having that direction, you know, but it's, it's that continuous improvement um, on, on how, to, how to get to that 40% as a first step, but then um, reducing further. Um, so I just want, yeah, we'll just go through this so we have some time to for the Q and A. Um, I mentioned earlier about functionality. This is really uh, not covered in in many guidance or or or, doc, or documentation or articles we've seen out there about embodied carbon. But we can reduce a lot of impact by maximizing the functionality. So if you, for example, if you increase the net level area of your building you don't have to build as much because you're making good use of that space. You can use uh, hot desking, so you have more people, more occupancy using that asset, so you don't have to build as much. You can increase the lifespan. How can you design for durability and circularity? So you're also diluting the impacts over a longer period of time. Uh, and then we go on to the, the strategies on uh, low carbon materials. You now we've seen bio-based materials, uh, timber, um, cladding options, all with this regener regenerative design uh, option where you're sinking carbon into your buildings and making you know that part of the, the whole global transition to low carbon. It's really important you run whole life scenarios for your building services as well. For example, if you add in PV, solar photovoltaic to your projects, you're actually increasing the upfront emissions because you're adding more materials, you're adding aluminum, you're adding silica to your projects. There's a lot of cabling and all of that electronics. But what is the actual net benefit over the life? So it's important that if you're increasing your upfront emissions when adding renewable energy, you understand the, the payback period throughout the operational phase. Also with refrigerant gases, so if you working with low GWP, low carbon refrigerant gas, you need to understand the efficiency of those plants, the, the chiller or air source heat pump throughout the lifespan. So you, you calculate in the net benefit of those um, improvements. Same with high efficiency facades. So if you are specifying double glazing, you have to, you have to make sure that's paying off over time in your operational savings. So it's really important you run that whole life carbon scenario. EPDs, as I um, touched on earlier, it's, it's increased use, verify the, the, the scope with that EPD. If you're comparing apples with apples, ask for EPDs from your suppliers and consider that whole lifespan in, 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 in the end of life impacts. So you design it for deconstruction in this assembly as well. Um, it's interesting because the solutions to reduce uh, the impacts with supply chain will be the most challenging. It's very difficult to, to make it viable, both uh, environmental and financially, but they're gonna be the most impactful. So it's, it's a good challenge ahead of us. But I think I, I wrap up my presentation with this last slide. If you have contact details, feel free to reach out to us if you can assist um, in this route to net zero carbon. Well, I'll uh, hand back to Charles to mediate the questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Victor, Adrian, and Enrique. It was, it was a very insightful presentation. And I'm conscious you did share a lot of information in just less than an hour. Um, 
which raised a lot of questions. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of questions that um, have we've touched on a way or another. So I think uh, as I go through the question that came in, um, you all three might need to repeat some of the things that you touched on already or I'm trying to address the same uh, argument from a different angle. So apologize if that's the case, but uh, it's a very complex topic. And so I'll try to do my best um, to convey the message, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the essence of the question really. Um, so something that really came up a few times from, from, from many attendees is a question um, um, to how do we want to address embodied carbon for an existing building, building versus a new build? A new build. Um, uh, particularly there are questions around re the retrospective calculation of, of, of embodied carbon emissions. Uh, so emissions that have been emitted in the past, is it something that is, well, first of all, is it something that is possible? Um, is it something that is actually useful in any way? Uh, and if we were to try to, to you know, to, to reach like, to, to get the, the, the largest gain in terms of emission, is that even worth trying to look at those embodied carbon for existing buildings? Um, is this something that, uh, that you want to comment, Enrique? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's really important that we measure, we quantify in order to find a solution, right? So a, a problem well stated, uh, it's a problem half solved. So that's a very common saying in, in life cycle assessment practice. Uh, that's why I brought that as built uh, calculation as a as an opportunity, right? So for existing assets, you can use that um, um, as built information to assist future projects if you're designing new projects. But if you're mainly uh, maintaining and, and operating existing assets, you're going to be talking about retrofitting. So what are the best options you can um, choose from in terms of your available budget that will contribute the most? So when you do your, your life cycle assessment, you compare in different options. So if you retrofitting your facade, if you're changing your, your refrigerant gas, if, if you're implementing um, uh, building management systems to control, automate lighting, automate uh, room temperature, all of these needs to be analyzed together. So you, you run each strategy to understand the relevance of each one. You, We lost a or is it just me? I think he's. No. I think we lost him a moment. I think we lost an IK. So he he will be back in a few minutes, I'm sure. <laughs> Great. Um, in the meantime, uh, while he's while he's back, um, I suggest we can move on to the next question, next question and we'll give him a, a bit, a bit, one more minute when he's back. As, assuming he's, he's back on time, obviously, uh, to finish his sentence at least, because that would be a bit rude. <laughs> um, uh, there is another question that that uh, obviously when when we talk about carbon we talk about you know projects um, there is always a question out. on oh, final yes. oh and Enrique you're back I'm back sorry I dropped out you dropped out literally one minute ago so if you want to finish then your sentence that's okay no I'm just saying it's important that you compare if if you if you reducing impact of existing assets it's important in doing retrofitting. It's important that you run a comparison for all the, the potential strategies to understand how much carbon you save for each dollar spent, right? So you can prioritize these strategies. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebound exactly on your last sentence because that's, that's really a per perfect segue to the next question. There was a question on costs. And obviously, when, when it comes to you know, investing or retrofitting an asset or simply building an asset differently uh, to have a lower embodied carbon uh, amount, um, there is always a value of, uh, there is always a question of cost. How much does that cost? And is that even, does that pay off actually? Um, and the question is about has Grez, but well, I can already answer, we haven't, but or has ETO performed any analysis on financial gains for going for low embodied carbon assets, um, both on the new build side, but also maybe on the retrofit, retrofitting projects. Do you have any material to share with the audience on this? Uh, yeah, we have we have case studies. We have um, hotspot analysis studies where you you identify this key. But it's it's really it really depends on the the typology and the the location. What dominates the impacts? So before we know what's driving the the, the impact and where the opportunities are, you, you need to quantify, right? So 
um, in our website, we have case studies where we show the strategies that have the most, um, you know, you can have low hanging fruits from like automating your lighting controls, driving behavior change, automating your, your room temperature, all of that. It's, it's low cost and achieve high, um, high, high savings. So it really depends on the, on the, on the, you know, specific, it, it's a custom analysis. Yeah. You need to, to, to assess your application, your building type. And then from there you can pinpoint what's the, yeah, the low hanging fruits. Thanks, Nike. Uh, we're, we're right at the, at the top of the hour. Um, so for the ones who still have a few minutes, uh, we'll try to address maybe two, two more questions, very short one. There is a really good one on regulation that I'm happy to provide the great, the great perspective on. Uh, but before that, Victor or Adrian, would you, is there any, any question that, that you thought was, was, uh, was relevant to address before that one? No, there is only uh, one that, uh, but it was anonymous. I think they asked about like, if you retain the foundation of a building, you already, you already uh, retain a significant amount of embodied carbon. So they ask, what do we need to do to encourage architects or civil engineers uh, to retain, or if it's the client or developer who needs to be influenced? Uh, and I think this is a great one because there are a few uh, strategies to reduce your embodied carbon uh, uh, impact, like uh, Enrique mentioned before. And one of those is actually to build for the future. So build for reusing, build for, for, for recycling, taking into account the disposal, uh, the end of life treatment of the materials. So this, is, this exactly uh, should be encouraged through the whole value chain. It touch points again on the building value chain and the influencer value chain, as we talked about. Uh, developers uh, will influence from the top down the, the building sector and the building operators to have this in mind when disposing an asset to retain, because we should, the more you like recycle or reuse, less is your embodied carbon impact when retrofitting or rebuilding. So uh, yeah, this just wanted to raise to talk about this one before you go for the regulation, Charles. Thanks, Victor. Um, one more minute for the ones who are still with us on the line. Um, there was a good one uh, on regulation. I thought it would I would pick it up. Um, the question is about most sustainability regula regulation focuses on operational carbon, which are uh, in our perspective the reason why project developers or investors should care about embodied carbon from a business perspective. So I think I'm happy to provide a grass perspective here. Uh, what we've obviously noticing is there is a, there's a big difference in, in level of maturity between, those issue, between two issues. On the one side, operational carbon, on the one embodied carbon, there is a, a lower level of, of understanding in general uh, on the latter compared to the first one. And that's obviously, it doesn't mean that it matters less. It means that it's less understood. And obviously something that is less understood is not addressed um, as a priority, and which is obviously the very reason of organizing this webinar <laughs> is to try to raise awareness. So, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to address that. Um, if you look at the results of the great assessment that, that Victor uh, showed us, there is a very, very small, I mean, half the participant uh, who are developers are able to have a policy on, on embodied carbon, less than a half, I think, like 48%. Um, if you look at the same question on the operational side, well, that's almost 95 plus percent. So obviously there is, that demonstrates a difference in, in level of, under, of understanding in the first place. And if you look at the percentage who are able to disclose any, anything that goes to 17 out of the 50 percent or something. So about 8 percent if I, if I, if I, my math are correct. So definitely a, a key difference here in terms of level, level of expert, I mean, expertise, you no, know, but understanding overall. Um, as, and what we could expect going forward as that level increases and you know, awareness being raised and maybe the understanding of how mature that issue is in the future is that um, you know, expectation on the investor side, at least the most sophisticated one will increase and there will, be, will become requirements from their investee to report, to, to monitor, to capture, uh, to, to monitor, to report and obviously eventually to, to reduce. Um, uh, as we've seen with Operation Carbon, and the best example is in, in Europe at SFDR, well, addressing about, uh, Operation Carbon, 
we there is there was a gap between the most sophisticated investment investment uh, institute investment out there and the regulation that has followed at, at, you know the, at the later stage. So as long as this is really being taking the lead by by the most sophisticated investors out there, you can expect that it will impact regulation at the, at the later stage. But that will take some time. Um, uh, we we definitely expect that it's going to take some years, and we hope it's going to happen. Of course. Great. Um, I think we're four minutes um, after three p.m. our time, at least. Um, so I think um, I think that's enough for now. If we haven't gone through all questions, that's the case. We'll try. We'll do our best to follow up offline, as I said earlier. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be uh, joined by uh, all three: uh, Victor, Henrique, and Vien today. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, we will share the slide online uh, on our website, so the slide will be available um, to you all. We tend to also share the recording. I'm not sure whether we're going to share that one. I don't know yet. I might check internally for that, but the slide will be available. That's definitely sure. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for your attendance and uh, see you very soon. Bye.